Well, greetings in the name of Jesus. This is Pastor and Evangelist Joel Hitchcock and I welcome you to our Good Friday service. I know it's not 7 o'clock yet, our service starts at 7 o'clock, but we're going to take this opportunity to pray and just quiet our minds and get ready. I do want to tell you before we pray and I'm going to read some scriptures, I, we are going to have communion at the end of the service. So I have with me a cracker. I want to invite you to go and get yourself a cracker of any kind. I mean, um, it can also be a, just a regular piece of bread if you don't have any crackers. Uh, I also have my communion juice with me. And all of these is grape juice. Last time during Passover on Wednesday, we actually had water because I did not have uh, juice available at that time, only later. So. Uh, the idea is whether it's bread or cracker or is it juice or water, the symbolic power is that it is the wonderful body and blood of Jesus. So get that ready and at the end of the meeting we're going to have our communion. So uh, at, during this time I want you to know we're going to pray and read the word. Now remember on Sunday morning, we'll have service at 10 o'clock, Sunday morning, right here, same place. So log in at about 9.45, so we can also pray again and so forth and be ready for our service at 10 o'clock, Sunday morning. I also want to uh, encourage you to um, call somebody or share this video right now on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, or whatever you use. Please share it, email it to somebody. Text it to somebody, um, you know, go get your phone out right now, text them the link, just copy that link, put it in the text, and let as many people as you possibly uh, feel led to do, you know, let them, let them connect with us. Also, we are on the phone right now, people can hear us on the phone, so just um, if some, you know somebody who does not have internet, they can call the number on the phone and the, they can call the number on the screen and call us on the phone and just put those access numbers in, push pound and you will also be connected by our phone. So having said that, we're going to repeat that just a little later, but let's pray together and ask the Lord for His wonderful presence in the service. Lord, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for this time that we can quiet our minds and quiet our hearts before you and I ask you Lord that your wonderful presence will come and fill this room my room my brother and sister's room Lord let your wonderful presence fill the earth your word says that the glory of the Lord will cover the earth like the waters cover the sea and I ask you Lord that your Glory will cover the earth on this wonderful Good Friday service. Oh Lord, we just come and ask you for your grace. We ask you for your presence. And Lord, as we get ready for our service at 10 o'clock, we ask that you bless us. We ask you, Lord, that you make a way for us. We ask you, Lord, that you honor us with your presence. I pray, Lord, that you anoint Joel Hitchcock as he brings your word and that the, the word of life will be crisp and clear from, from, from the Spirit and touch the people of God. And I pray, Lord, for an anointed ear that the people's hearing, hearing shall be anointed and opened. Your word says you'll give us an open ear that we may hear. And let us do as Revelation says, that we will hear what the Spirit of the Lord would say unto the churches. And right now we ask you, Holy Spirit, speak to us. Uh, we're going to read a scripture now. 
uh, for those of you logging in, I just want you to, to know we're starting at 7 o'clock. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to pray and get our minds quieted, read a couple of scriptures. I also want you to know, get yourself a cracker or a piece of bread, get yourself water or some juice in any cup, and we will have communion uh, at the end of the service. So a little later, I'll be speaking about the supernatural events surrounding the uh, death of Jesus, the crucifixion. And I just want to read to you here for a while before we actually will be preaching on it. So let's quiet our minds. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Matthew 27. Now when morning was come, all the chief priests and the elders of the people to counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away. And the governor delivered him up to Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, who betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself, brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed innocent blood. But they said, What is that to us? See thou to it. And he cast down the pieces of silver into the sanctuary and departed and went away and hanged himself. And the chief priests took the pieces of silver and said, It is not lawful to put them in the treasury, since it is the price of blood. And they took counsel and brought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore, that field was called the field of blood, even as it is unto this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, and they took the thirty pieces of silver and the price of him that was priced, whom certain of the children of Israel did price. And they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord appointed me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then saith Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he gave him no answer, not even one word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. Now at the feast the governor was wont to release unto the multitude one prisoner whom they would. And they had a notable prisoner called Barabbas. When therefore they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? And he knew that for envy they had delivered him up. And while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with this righteous man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. But the governor answered and said unto them, Which of these two will ye that I release unto you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said unto them, What then shall I do unto Jesus who is called Christ? And all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out exceedingly, saying, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he prevailed nothing, but rather that a tumult was arising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this righteous man. See ye to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. And then released he unto them Barabbas. But Jesus he scourged and delivered to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered unto him the whole band. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And they plaited a crown of thorns and put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they kneeled down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spat upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took off from him the robe and put it 
put on him his garments and led him away to be crucified. And as they came out, they found a man from Cyrene, Simon by name, whom they compelled to go with them, that he might bear his cross. When they were come unto the place called Golgotha, that is to say, the place of the skull, they gave him wine to drink mingled with gall, and when he had tasted it, he would not drink. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments among them, casting lots, and they sat and watched him there. And they set up over his head the accusation written, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. And there, then are there crucified with him two robbers, one on the right hand and one on the left. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads, saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself if thou art the Son of God. Come down from the cross. In like manner the chief priests mocked him with the scribes and the elders. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. He is the King of Israel. Let him come now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he desireth him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers also that were crucified with him cast upon him the same reproach. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood there, when they heard it said, This man calls for Elijah. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. And the rest said, Let it be. Let's see if Elijah cometh to save him. And Jesus cried again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil in the temple was rent in two from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints that had fallen asleep were raised. And coming forth out of the tombs, after his resurrection, they entered into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were done, feared exceedingly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. And many women were there beholding from afar, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering unto him, among whom was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. And when evening was come, there was a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, and Pilate commanded it to be given up. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and departed. And Mary Magdalene was there, and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulchre. Now on the morrow, which is the day after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees were gathered together un to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that this deceiver said, While he was yet alive, after three days I rise again. Command us, therefore, that the sepulchre be made sure unto the third day, lest haply his disciples come and steal him away and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, and the last error will be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, You have a guard. Go, make it as sure as you can. And they went and made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone, the guard being with them. So we are preparing our hearts and our minds right now for prayer, during prayer and reading the scriptures on this beautiful 
Sunday, uh, sorry, Friday, um, Good Friday service. And thank you for those who are on already. I appreciate you coming in early that we can just pray, get our minds right, read the word and just prepare for what the Lord is going to do in the service. I, I appreciate you and, and I just pray, Lord, in Jesus' name that your anointing will fill this place. We start at seven o'clock uh, with our service. But Lord, in the meantime, I ask you that your glory will just fill us, fill this room and fill the internet waves, fill those who are listening by telephone. And God, I ask you that you will have your way and that we will hear what the Spirit would say unto the people. Well, we're almost there. It's almost seven o'clock. And we've been praying and preparing our hearts. I do want to say a couple of things. We're going to have communion at the end of the meeting. So I want to ask you, go get yourself a cracker or a piece of bread. At the end of the meeting, we're going to have communion. Also, I have with me some grape juice. You can use grape juice or you can just use water. You can use any cup. Go get that and be ready for the service. After the service, we're going to have communion. And I know it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful, blessed time. God's Spirit is going to move in our midst here today as we celebrate the glorious death of Jesus. And in a few minutes, I'll be, not long now, a couple of minutes, I'll be speaking on the events surrounding the death of Jesus, specifically the supernatural events, the supernatural events surrounding the birth of Jesus, but uh, the death of Jesus. But in the meantime, would you please share this with somebody? Share that YouTube link on uh, wherever you can. Text it to somebody. Uh, let's get as many people with us today as possible to be part of this service. Um, and we are on Facebook. Share it on Facebook. If you're on Facebook, just push that share button and share it. Please com comment on Facebook. Please comment on um, YouTube. Uh, we also on Twitter and on LinkedIn. I also want to uh, say that if you know somebody who does not have access to the internet, let them call the number on the screen and then put that access code on and they can actually hear me now on this phone. People can hear me right now on this phone who call in. Praise God. So, all right, we have a f uh, just a about a minute left. Let's continue to just quiet our minds before the Lord and then we're going to get into the Word. Lord, I thank you today. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful time. Lord, thank you that we could prepare our hearts, prepare our minds in the name of Jesus. Oh, Lord, we love you. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you came. Holy Spirit, won't you tell us more about that lovely name? Oh, on a hill far away stood that old rugged cross. We celebrate your wonderful death today on that cross, Lord Jesus, and all that you did for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Well, it is time. It is seven o'clock and we are going to have church right now. Thank you for those who have already been with us during the intercession time. It's been a wonderful, wonderful time. And uh, we read the scriptures, we prayed and so forth. I do want to say before I share the word, I've already shared this before the service, but now officially we're going to have communion at the end of the service. Please get yourself a, a cracker or a piece of bread, any bread and uh, be ready for receiving communion. I also have with me a cup filled with grape juice. In our Passover service, I actually had water because I didn't have grape juice at that time. Since then, I actually do have the grape juice, but you can use water or grape juice or anything you'd, you'd like, and let's be ready for communion at the end. Okay, well, praise God. Today is Good Friday, and I want to share about the supernatural events surrounding the death of Jesus. You know, the death of Jesus is a powerful thing. Nobody could die like Jesus. Nobody could be born like Jesus. I mean, born of a virgin, you know, all the supernatural events around these 
his, uh, his, his birth, uh, the supernatural events surrounding his resurrection, but even in his death, there is supernatural events that we're going to share with right now. Some of them don't seem so supernatural, but they are. Others are just blatantly, boldly, powerfully supernatural. So I want to ask you, open your Bible in the book of Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, and we are going to spend a lot of time here in the scriptures. I said 28, I mean Matthew 20, 26. Matthew 26 <coughs> and uh, verse 1. It says, And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished all these words, he said unto his disciples, You know that after two days the Passover cometh, and the Son of Man is delivered up to be crucified. Then gathered together the chief priests and the elders of the people unto the court of the high priest, who is called Caiaphas, and they took counsel together that they might take Jesus supply and kill him. But they said, Not during the feast, let a tumult arise among the people. Now Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper. And there came unto him a woman having an alabaster cruise of exceeding ointment, precious ointment, and she poured it upon his head as she sat at meat. So let me start off here by telling you, uh, and I'm not going to say much about this part, but this is an awesome event. When Jesus was about to be crucified, Jesus directly associated his death with the Jewish Passover. Now, I'm not going to say much about that because I preached a whole message on that and I want to ask you, please, go back to YouTube or Facebook and see my message on Wednesday which was Passover, and I share all about the Passover and how it ties into Jesus. And the Bible tells us that Christ is our Passover. So that's all I'm going to say right now, but that's the first event. The second event is, while Jesus was sitting at meat at Simon the leper, the Bible tells us that a woman came, and I continued reading, with a cruise of exceeding precious ointment, and and uh, she poured it upon his head and sat at meat at the table. And when his disciples saw it, they were f had indignation, saying, For what purpose is this waste? Can you believe that the Creator of heaven and earth was criticized that somebody anointed Jesus with precious oil? Today we still have those Pharisees amongst us. In this case, it wasn't even Pharisees, it was disciples, his own disciples. Well, maybe I have that wrong. Yes, it says, but when the disciples saw that. So here we have obvious Pharisees and disciples, and you know both of them can be wrong. We always get on the Pharisees' case with their religious spirit, and that is true. But do you know that oftentimes disciples themselves can have that religious spirit? Let me tell you something. Jesus is the Son of God, is the King of Kings, is the King of Israel and the King of the universe. And Jesus, we can give Him all the glory and the praise. And we can honor Him even with precious ointment and any substance. But that is not the main point here. It continues and says, This ointment could have been sold for much and given to the poor, but Jesus, perceiving it, said to them, Why trouble ye this woman? For ye she has wrought a good work upon me. For the poor have you with you always. Me ye do not have always. For in that she poured the ointment upon my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Now, do you know what that shows us? This is the second supernatural event, is that Jesus supernaturally already knew that he was going to be crucified. See, the crucifixion did not come to Jesus as a surprise. He didn't wake up one morning and uh, an evening and here come everybody taking him. Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen. Why? Because for this purpose he was born. When that little baby Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, the Son of God, let me tell you, that baby's main purpose was to be crucified. Now there's more than that, crucified, resurrected, all these teachings, so forth, and 
but it's mainly to be and destroy the devil, the works of the devil, but mainly to reconcile man and God because God was in that baby. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And what a wonderful thing that is. Jesus knew that he was going to be crucified. It did not come as a surprise. So that in itself is supernatural. And the Bible continues and says, Verily I say unto you that this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, that also which is this woman has done shall be spoken of in a memorial of her. And that's happening right now. The gospel has been preached all around the world. And here we are listening to the gospel through our, the television, through our uh, internet, uh, on, the ra- uh, on, the, on the phone and everything. And you know what? Bless God. Again, the story of what that woman did for Jesus is being broadcast all around the world. Jesus said it would happen. And look at that. It is happening right there. A supernatural event surrounding the crucifixion and the death of Jesus. Now verse 14 says, Then one of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me that I deliver him unto you? And they weighed unto him thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity to deliver him unto them. And this is interesting. Because when you read in the book of Luke, you'll see that this happened. Satan entered into Judas. Now we've heard of demon possession. Can you even, can you imagine Satan himself possession? I don't focus on the demon world that much. I mean, I come, I cast them out, I preach the gospel and and let the light of Jesus just drive them out. But it is important to know that there is a spirit world. There are angels and archangels and so forth, seraphim, but there's also a dark world, namely Satan and his demons and devils. And the Bible says that I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So when Satan once was a beautiful angel and rebelled against God, he fell like lightning from heaven and became Satan. He wasn't created evil. He was created a beautiful archangel that covereth and, and, and there was musical instruments built into him, organs and pipes, the Bible said. When he moved, it was all a, he, was, he was a beautiful angel. Even the word Lucifer means son of the morning. You know, it was a shining bright angel. But then he fell when he rebelled against God. So today when people are demon possessed, those angels that associated with Lucifer, they, you know, possess people, we cast them out. But in this case, Satan himself came and possessed Judas. I don't know if I've seen, if found any place in the Bible where anybody was possessed with Satan himself. Maybe, but it would be clear that when the Son of God was to be crucified, Satan said, listen demons, you, you do a good job, but I'm going to do this myself. He had other reasons too. He got, he, he, possessed, he possessed Judas. And you know what happened? The Bible says when he went to betray Jesus, he told all the, you know, all the, all the troops with him, he said, the one that I kiss, he is the one. And he went and he kissed Jesus on the cheek, I guess, and, and uh, maybe it was just on the shoulders, you know. But Jesus said, Judas, do you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And you know what happened at that moment? The word kiss and the word worship in the Greek is the same word, proskuneo. So when you say, I worship God, it means I'm kissing God. And when you say, I'm kissing the face of God, it means I'm worshipping God. Now remember when Jesus was, cruc- was tempted in the wilderness when he was fasting 40 days and 40 nights. You know, Satan tempted him, cast yourself off from here and command the, bread to make, uh, the stones to be made bread. He went through all those. But there was one that he took him to a high mountain. And what did he do? He showed him all the kingdoms of this world. 
And he said, all this will I give you if you fall down and worship me. That word worship is the word kiss. So when Satan entered Judas and went personally to Jesus when they, Jesus was being betrayed and captured for the crucifixion, Satan was in Judas giving Jesus one more chance. It's like he was saying, Jesus, remember I told you, if you just fall down and worship me, kiss me, that's the word kiss and worship is the same thing in Greek. If you just fall down and worship me, then I will give you the kingdoms of this world. Listen, Jesus, I, I, I'll still do my part. I'll still give you the kingdom. Of this. You don't have to go through this. Trust me, it's going to be bad. It's going to be brutal. You'll be crucified. You'll be beat to a pulp. And plus that, you'll have the weight, an emotional weight on you and a mental weight on you, like you, that is just out of this world. You don't have to go through this. And we know it was very heavy. And he said, if you'll just worship me. That's what was symbolic when, he, when Judas came and kissed the ch- Jesus. At that moment, the word kiss means worship. He was basically saying, come on, worship me. When he, when he, but you know what? Jesus said, Judas, to betray ye the Son of Man with a kiss. He, Satan gave him one more chance. Aren't you glad that Jesus resisted that temptation? I mean, just like that, he could have been out. But he did this for us. He wanted to, he wanted to be crucified. But I'm a little ahead of myself, but it's all part of the bigger story. So let's continue to hear what the word says here. And it says there that they weighed unto him 30 pieces of silver. And that 30 pieces of silver was a prophecy that was given. When you look at the Old Testament, and we've just read read here also, we'll read here as we go on, that that Matthew associates that 30 pieces of silver with a prophecy of the Old Testament that they would give 30 pieces of silver to betray the Messiah. Let me tell you, yes, Jesus is about to be crucified and supernaturally He is bringing... Bible prophecy to pass. He wasn't even there. Judas and the Pharisees and the chief priests or whatever, they were negotiating and they said, all right, let's do 30 pieces of silver. We'll give you 30 pieces of silver. They should have known, you know, uh, that word 30 pieces of silver, that's reminding me of something. Uh, But it was right there in the book of Jeremiah. And then of all things, when Judas came back. He said, I betrayed the blood of an innocent man. He took the pieces of silver and threw it on the floor in the sanctuary, in the temple. And so the Pharisees and, I mean, the chief priests took it all back. Said, well, we, we, what shall we do with this money? This is blood money. And then they bought a potter's field, uh, I believe for burial purposes. And you know what? Even that was a supernatural event because they were fulfilling Bible prophecy. As I'll read to you that scripture in a moment. Uh, they, they, the, but the very thing, it was 30 pieces of silver and the very thing that they bought a potter's field is exactly the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Hallelujah! Let me tell you, Jesus did not just die. Jesus supernaturally fulfilled Bible prophecy and was engaged with supernatural events surrounding his death. Now it's going to get even more exciting as we continue. If you think this is good, wait till we continue. There is so many good stuff here. So stay with me, please, through this whole meeting and share it with somebody, please. Um, So the Bible goes and says, um, in verse 17, Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Where wilt thou that we make ready the, to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The teacher saith, My time is at hand. Keep, I, I keep the Passover at my house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Now, when you read the book of Luke, you'll see some other things that happen at the same time. So Jesus tells his disciples, when you enter the city, this is the prophet Jesus. He's not only a prophet, he's the son of God, but he was also the prophet. The Bible calls him the prophet. 
And he told them, when you go into the city, you'll see a man walking with a jug of water. Follow him, and whatever house he enters, go in and prepare the Passover over there. Now what's the chances? Everything worked together. Jesus saw this in advance. Jesus had advanced knowledge and he told them to go forward and when they get to the city and they enter into the city, they would see a man carrying a jug of water. Follow him in the house that he goes in. There the Passover uh, will be furnished and then you prepare it for us. And they went and it happened exactly as Jesus said. Isn't that amazing? Jesus is fulfilling Bible prophecy. Oh, hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? So now let's continue. They, I'm talking about the supernatural events surrounding the death of Jesus. So it continues and it says, Now when evening was come, he was sitting at meat with the twelve disciples. And as they were eating, he said, Verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful and began to say one to, unto him, Every one, is it I, Lord? And he answered and said, He that dips his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth, even as it is written of him, but woe to the man through whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Good were it for that man if he had not been born. And Judas, who betrayed him, answered and said, Is it I, Rabbi? And he said unto him, Thou hast said. And as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and blessed it, and brake it and gave to the disciples and said, Take this, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them and said, Drink ye all of it. This is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the remission of sins. I say unto you, I shall not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until the day that I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now, I'm not going to share with you all the details of the Passover. Please watch my message on Passover night, Wednesday night. You'll see it on YouTube. But what I do want to share with you is the new covenant. You see, when Jesus got the bread out and the wine out, he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Let me tell you, this is powerful. Why? Because when Jesus said that, he was not just pulling it out of the air. When Jesus said that, he knew exactly what he was talking about from the Old Testament. The Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, in Christian circles it's called the Old Testament. Then we have the New Testament. So in the Old Testament, Jeremiah spoke about the New Covenant. And so when Jesus said, this is the the, the, the um the blood of the new covenant in my blood, the, the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Anybody who had a clue of the Old Testament knew that that was in the Bible and that Jesus was now actively bringing forth the new covenant that was prophesied of and predicted of by Jeremiah the prophet. Let me take you to Jeremiah, please. Because there's some awesome things right there. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 31. Give me a chance to get there. I'll give you a chance to get there and we'll all work together. Jeremiah chapter 31. And look what the word says. Verse 31. Jeremiah 31 verse 1. Jeremiah 31 verse 31. Behold, the days will come, says Jehovah, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So here the Bible says God will make a new covenant. A new covenant. So when Jesus said this is the 
cup of the new covenant in my blood. He was not pulling that out of thin air or just speaking by the inspiration of the Spirit, which he obviously was doing too, but he was referring to a specific prophecy that a new covenant will be made with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Then it says, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith Jehovah. It says, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith Jehovah. I will put my law in their inward parts and in their heart I will write it and I will be their God and they will be my people. You see, in the Old Testament, what happened was you would have certain things that you have to do to, uh, to please God. I kind of said that wrong, but let's just stay with my, my thought right here. You had to, you know, do the commandments. Not only the Ten Commandments, but all those 630 some commandments that the old Torah had. And God said, I'm making a new covenant. Not according to the covenant I made before, which is that Torah, but a new one. In the Torah, the Old Testament times, they had to <laughs> they had to do the works. They had to do those works. It was all works based. But in the new covenant, you do the works. And here's the thing. He puts his law in your spirit man. See, when you get born again, let me say this. For those of you perhaps listening from another religion, when I was in India and so forth, they talk about, well, we don't want people to be converted from Hinduism to Christianity. And I tell people, we are not converting people from one religion to another religion. Never been doing that, never ever. And I've preached all around the world. I've been to over 47 countries, I think, preached big crusades and all that in Muslim nations, Hindu nations, uh, and, and, and the darkness, uh, dark areas of Africa. And you know, never am I converting somebody from Islam to Christianity, Judaism to Christianity, Hinduism to Christianity. Never been in a Buddhist area, but from a Buddhism to Christianity, I've never been doing that. What I do is I bring people to a relationship with Jesus where Jesus Christ comes into their heart. And I tell you, the Bible says when Jesus comes into your heart, He gives you a new mind and a new spirit and a new heart. So, the new covenant is not based on works. The new covenant is not based on the Torah. The new covenant is based on your reborn spirit. And that new reborn spirit has a brand new nature. And you now do by your brand new nature the works of God. You see, you do not become, you do not become righteous by doing righteous works. You do righteous works because you are righteous. Because Jesus caused you to be born again. Because Jesus put a new spirit in you. A new covenant is affected and God's spirit dwells in you. And by nature, you have the nature of Jesus. By nature, you have the nature of the Holy Spirit. I can't say it in all these years I've been preaching in English. I can't say it in, uh, in English. But the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5. I say it in Afrikaans first. Die vrug van die gees is liefde, blijdskap, vrede, langmoedigheid, vriendelijkheid, goedheid, getrouheid, sagmoedigheid en selfbeheersing. Can the Afrikaans people give me a good amen? But you see, in the... The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, faith. I'm getting better. Amen. Uh, temperance and something else. 
praise God, that is the fruit of the Spirit. That is the very nature that's on the inside of you. So when Jesus said, this is the covenant, you know, it wasn't even just the bread and the wine. He was telling them, I'm about to go to the cross. When I die on the cross, those who put my faith, their faith in me, in my death and my resurrection, my spirit will come and dwell in them and my laws will be in their minds. My laws will be in their hearts. This is the new covenant in my blood. <laughs> Hallelujah. But listen, this is awesome. Listen, listen. Um, it says a little later, you know, it's, it says, um, oh, here it is, verse 34. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, No, Jehovah, for they shall all know me, from the least of them even unto the greatest of them, saith Jehovah. Reading from the American Standard Version, I use different versions, and this is uh, one of them that I use. But listen to this. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin will I remember no more. Their sin I will remember no more. Oh, hallelujah. See, the, the Lord brought a new covenant. And here's the thing, the blood of Jesus does not just cover your sin. The blood of Jesus washes your sins as if it never happened. Have you or I, I've done it, look back at my past, you know, I, I got to know the Lord as a young man, so I didn't really have, I mean, I was still 10 years old, so it's not much you can do at, up to age 10, you know. But I did my fair share of sins, you know, so understand that part. However, I look back and I think of the things that I did do. And, I'm, and, I, and then it comes back and I feel, you know, I, sh I, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't say that bad word or whatever. And treated somebody so disrespectfully, which I did. Um, I was an older man once and I treated him so disrespectfully the way I talked and acted. And, you know, and, and, and there's worse things in our lives. But listen. Then we look back and we, our, our past haunts us. And we think of all the things we've done, the drug use, you know, the whatever, all these horrible things that we've done. And we remember it. But I want you to know, if God does not remember it, why should you remember it? Because when the blood of Jesus comes, I hear people say, oh, it's all under the blood. It's not even under the blood. The blood has washed it away. When the blood of Jesus washes your sins away, it is not covering it. It is not God just winking at it. The blood of Jesus washes your sins away as if it did not happen. That's the wonderful thing. And because it did not happen, the Bible says, I will remember their sin no more. It doesn't mean that God says, well, I remember, but I'm going to act like a... No. God does not remember this. Now this is from amazing. This is supernatural because God knows everything. He is omnipresent and omniscient and omnipotent too. But omniscient, He means everything. He knows everything. He knows what's in your heart. He knows what's in your mind. He knows what's in your past. He knows what's in your future. He knows, he knows every single thing about you. Even the things you did in secret that nobody knows, God knows and should be repented of. But I want you to know, when the blood of Jesus comes upon your soul and washes your sins away, it, you, the Bible says, if your sin was as scarlet, I will make it white as snow. Because Jesus washed all your sins away. And it's as if it never happened. Here we have it, the new covenant. Remember Jesus said, this is the new covenant in my blood. What new covenant was it? It was the covenant that prophesied of in Jeremiah 31 and verse 34 says, I'll remember their sin no more. I'm telling you, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and His death on the cross has given you the wonderful opportunity to be cleansed of your sin, 
to the point where God will remember your sin no more. Oh, hallelujah. If I was in church right now, I'd be clapping my hands and if I was in a revival service, I'd be running around the aisles. Praise the Lord. And I, I just feel that we're all being blessed here today. Are you being blessed so far? No, we're not done yet. We, we got some deep, good stuff coming. The best is yet to come. But let's go back to Matthew. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 26. And uh, see the rest that the Lord had done. Praise God. So, you know, there's so many things here that I probably should just skim over because I want to, there's some heavy stuff. I want to really, I don't want to compromise some of the better stuff in the end. So some of these things I'm just going to go through. Can you, let's do that. I'm still going to share everything with you, but I'm going to go some bullet point by bullet point now and then get to some of the glorious, glorious stuff so we can see what the Lord did there. So, Matthew 26, verse 32, Jesus foreknew his resurrection. In fact, he told these brothers, he said, to go and meet me in Galilee. Now, this is before he was even crucified. Jesus already said, I will rise again, and when I do, go meet me in Galilee. I think it went through into the one ear and out the other, and they had no clue, like, Lord, what are you talking about? <laughs> and... Uh, and they didn't even ask, you know, because it was such a holy, holy moment. But what part do you not understand that meet me after my resurrection, meet me in Galilee? Well, after Jesus was resurrected, he even told uh, the, uh, the girls in Matthew 28 verse 10, tell my brethren to meet me in Galilee. Jesus also fore foreknew his denial by Peter. Matthew 26 verse 33 and Matthew 10 verse 33 says, If you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father and the angels that are in heaven. Not only did he foreknow that Peter would deny him, but he said, You will deny me thrice before the cock crows. And when Peter denied Jesus the third time, at that moment, the cock crowed. And the Bible says he turned his head to Peter and looked at Peter from a distance. Peter went out and wept bitterly. But praise God for the forgiveness that comes through Jesus Christ and Jesus forgave him, hallelujah, and made him the powerful, powerful apostle. Um, Matthew 26 verse 39 speaks of the supernatural subjection to God's plan. Now, I'm not going to read that now, but I'm going to tell you that is supernatural because you see the Bible says that Jesus could call 12 legions of angels and immediately put a stop to this. Jesus also prayed to his Father. Now Jesus is God to start with, but he was also human. He was God and man. So his human part knew that this is, this is serious stuff to go to this cross and everything that surrounds it, including the emotional and mental stress that comes when he takes the sin of the world upon him. You know what he said? He said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup of the bitterness of my suffering, let it pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And you know what? Jesus subjected himself to the will of God. In fact, when he said, not my will, but thy will be done, you know what happened? Oh, this is powerful. This will help you. Because when Jesus said, not my will, but thy will be done. He was not saying, well, I really don't want to do it, but I'll just do it, you know, and I'll go through grudgingly, whatever. Yeah, Lord, I'll do it. But no. The Bible says death and life are in the power of the tongue. So when Jesus spoke that, not my will, but thy will be done, he was telling his body, his human nature, you will not have your way, you will have God's way. When he said, not my will, but thine be done, he spoke it into existence and that gave him the strength to go through his trial. Are you going through a trial? I want you to know, speak to yourself. David spoke to himself. He said, bless the Lord, O my soul. He spoke to his own soul. David also um, spoke to himself at other occasions when he said, why art thou so 
downcast, O my soul, trust in the Lord. So David knew that when you speak it forth, there's power in your words, faith-filled words when you speak it. And when Jesus said, not my will but thine be done, that was a powerful principle that he put into practice by speaking forth what he wanted to happen. He wanted to be subject to the will of God and he denied his body and his human nature and said, not my will, but thine be done. Do you get it? If you don't read this, listen to this a little later again, you'll get it. it is, it's powerful. Now, <laughs> oh, this is glorious. This is glorious. Um, the Bible tells us that when they came to catch Jesus, right? Here comes all the guard with lanterns and torches and Judas among them. Jesus says to them, have I, what crime have I done? I've been in the temple. Why, do you have to come at night, you know, and, and uh, come with your lamps and torches and swords and so forth? Um, but you know what he told them? He said, whom seek ye? And they said, kind of arrogantly, I guess, Jesus of Nazareth, we seek Jesus of Nazareth. Where is he? And we grab that rascal, or whatever they said. And the Bible says in John, John chapter 18, Jesus said, it is I. Now when he said, it is I, the Bible says they went backward and fell on the ground. So what happened? Power was released from the mouth of Jesus. In fact, when Jesus said, it is I, he was saying something under the, under the radar also. Because what is God's name? Jehovah, right? Yahweh. And what does it mean? It means I am that I am. And God said to Moses, tell the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So when the, the, Jesus said, it is I or I am, he was in an underlying way saying, this is Jehovah God standing before you in the flesh. But when he said, I am, power came out of him and they were blasted down to the floor. And then they got up, surely they were staggering, a little bit more humiliated, humble. Jesus said, who seek ye? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. I'm sure they were like, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, please don't do that again. And Jesus, this is a good point, Jesus, they did not take Jesus, Jesus gave himself. No man taketh my life from me, John chapter 10 says, I give my life for my sheep. He proved to them, I can blast you into blisters in a moment, but here I am, take me. Nobody forced Jesus to the cross, he willingly went to the cross. But now this is powerful. Because do you know, at that same moment, it's very likely that somebody was resurrected when that happened. To understand what I mean, I want you to, I, this scripture I am going to read for you. But it's in the book of Mark. Mark chapter. Fourteen. Go with me to Mark. I'm not taking to all these scriptures. Thank you for those who are hanging with us. Are you being blessed? Is it worth just listening to the word here today? Mark chapter 14 and verse 51. Mark chapter 14 verse 51. This happened at the time that Jesus said to those who had came to catch him, he said, it is I, and they were blasted down to the floor. John doesn't talk about this, but Mark does. So at that time, Mark says, and a certain young man followed with him, having a linen cloth cast about him over his naked body, and they lay hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and fled naked. Now what a weird thing to put in the Bible over here. Because, you've got to see the background here, there at the Garden of Gethsemane was 
a cemetery. And the, there was a certain young man naked and just wrapped in a linen cloth. Now the Greek word for linen cloth, I heard a Greek teacher just the other day speak about it. Rick, War, um, Rick uh, Renner, by the way, if you can watch his stuff, it's really good. Rick Renner, and he was talking about that Greek word. And that Greek word for linen cloth, the only other time it's used is for the cloth that they wrapped around the dead. So, what was this? In that cemetery was a most probably a young man who was buried and a linen cloth was wrapped around him for the burial. But when Jesus said, it is I and the power of God blasted them to the floor, that same power also resurrected a young man who had just recently been buried. Hallelujah! The supernatural events surrounding the death of Jesus. Are you glad you continue to listen? We, we're far from done, so keep on listening. The Word is coming forth here today. The Word is coming forth here today. Okay, so I want to now take you back to the book of Matthew chapter 26. And now we're going to look at verse 50. Another supernatural thing that happened during the crucifixion of Jesus. It says, And Jesus said unto him, Friend, for what do that which for thou art come? And they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them that were with Jesus, which we know was Peter, stretched out his hand, drew his sword, and smote the servant of the high priest and struck off his ear. And Jesus said unto him, Put back your sword into its place, for all they that take the sword shall perish by the sword. So what happened here? Well, Peter was the one, we know that from the book of John, that Peter was the one who took the sword. And as the high priest's um, servant came after Jesus, Peter was ready to fight for his Jesus, man. He, and he got that sword and he swung it and he struck off the ear, completely severed the ear of uh, this man. And when we look in the book of John, we see the rest of the story. Remember Paul Harvey talking about the rest of the story? Well, let's look at the rest of the story. John chapter 18, verse 10. And it says, Simon Peter, therefore having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. Now the servant's name was Malchus. I'm going to say something about that in a moment. Jesus therefore said unto Peter, Put your sword into the sheath, the cup which the Father hath given me, shall I not drink it? So, before I tell you about the healing of that ear, here in John chapter 18, we see that the servant's name was Malchus. I ask you, why did John write? that the servant's name was Malchus. I mean, there's many other places you could say that, that things, you know, didn't put a name. Why did he say Malchus? I'll tell you why. Because Malchus was known to the readers of the book of John. You know what that means? Malchus gave his life to Jesus. Later on, Malchus gave his, his name was known among the early church. When, 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 when the people reading the book of John back then, at some point they must have said, and the man's name is Malchus. And some of them must have been, you mean Brother Malchus, the one that we you know, preaches like that or prophesies or, you know, our Malchus? That was our Malchus. See, Jesus was in a soul-saving business even right there when he was being attacked. But now here comes the good news. More good news. Supernatural thing. Why did Malchus give his life to Christ? Well, the Bible says Jesus touched his ear and healed it. Now, can you imagine that? You know, can you imagine the sword cuts off the ear and then they t the ear lies there, flopping like a fish in the, 
outside of the water. <laughs> and Jesus goes and takes the ear, puts it back on, and heals it. I tell you, Malchus, from that point onwards, Malchus was no longer the same. And, and I don't know how the high priest got past that. But Malchus' ear was healed. Jesus was in the healing business even as he was being crucified. Well, my friends, we're not done here. We're far from being done. So hang with me. There's some powerful things about to happen. And I'm going to go through a couple of bullet points here so that we don't uh, go too, too far uh, in our time. But the Bible says there that Jesus had access to 12 legions of angels. So what is 12 legions of angels? One legion is 5,000 Roman soldiers. So 12 legions would be 60,000 Roman soldiers. And Jesus said, I can pray any moment and call 12 legions of angels. And even that was symbolically because he could bring 12,000 legions of angels and beyond. You see, Jesus did not have to go to the cross. Any moment he could be delivered from his crucifixion. Now, Here's another part. Matthew 27, verse 16. The story of Barabbas. The story of Barabbas. This is amazing. You've got to hear this. So what happened was, Jesus is about to be crucified. Jesus is right there in front of Pilate. And Pilate asks, he's trying to find a way to save Jesus. But there's such a pressure on him politically and all the powerful religious leaders are around him. And he remembers there's a notorious prisoner. Everybody hated him. His name was Barabbas. And this Barabbas, the Bible says, was a murderer. And interestingly, the very name Barabbas means son of the father. So there's some prophetic things going on over here. Here you have the son of the father, Jesus Christ, and you have the son of the father, whose name is Barabbas. Just this interesting prophetic significance there. Jesus is the son of God, and Barabbas was the son of his father, the devil. Not the devil himself, but under the jurisdiction of Satan. And don't be too hard on Barabbas as being a son of the devil because you and I have been sons of the devil. You and I, every one of us, have been sons of the devil because we were without God, we were lost and without God and without hope in this world. And yes, Barabbas, he's notorious. So he's a murderer. You can just imagine there were other murderers in that time. But this was a notorious one. What did he do? Our imagination can just think what might have happened. What might he have done? It must have been the most horrific things that he had done, done because he was a notorious prisoner and a murderer and not just a regular murderer. And obviously you look at Jesus, the sweet son of God, with innocence in his eyes and a beauty in his face, looked like an angel being beat by the enemy. And then you have this ugly, rugged, rough, barabbas, arrogant, cussing, vulgar. Who do you want? Barabbas, the son of his father, or Jesus, the son of God? And they said, give us Barabbas. And you know what happened? Jesus died in Barabbas' place. Barabbas was supposed to be crucified that day. That morning they knocked on his cell door and said, Barabbas, time has come. And there goes Barabbas, he's going to be crucified. And here he stands before all these people. And Jesus is the one who would be crucified instead of Barabbas. Well, that is prophetic. This is a supernatural event. Why? Because it's the great exchange. See, you and I were supposed to perish. But God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You and I 
have eternal life because we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Jesus went to the cross while it should have been us going to the cross. Jesus was separated from God while it was us who had supposed to be eternally separated from God. In Barabbas, we see the great exchange taking place. There's a song that says, He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. My Jesus paid the price that I could never pay. You see, I owed a debt I could not pay. Barabbas owed a debt he could not pay. But Jesus paid a debt that he did not owe. He paid my debt. He paid Barabbas' debt. Isn't that glorious? Oh, just raise your hand for a moment and say, Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Jesus. Now, The Bible says that Jesus was standing at the judgment seat of Pilate. Now, Pilate was a powerful man. Pilate was right there, the most powerful man in that region. Herod had his jurisdiction, Pilate had his jurisdiction, and here he stands. Pilate can do this, and Jesus is saved or dead. But he stands there, and the Bible says Pilate was sitting in his judgment seat. Oh, how the roles will be changed one day. The Bible says we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Pilate himself one day, who was sitting arrogantly on his judgment seat and said, let him be crucified. Pilate will stand before Jesus one day. The great white throne judgment. Every one of you and me is going to stand before that judgment seat and will be judged according to our works. And the biggest work, which is not really a work, it is a reception of faith, will be, what have we done with Jesus? Have we accepted Jesus or rejected Jesus? If we've rejected Jesus, He will say, depart from me, I never knew you. And we'll go to a place of fire and brimstone. But for those who have accepted Him, we will go, and he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of your Lord. How wonderful is that? Praise God. Well, my brothers and sisters, while Pilate was sitting in that judgment seat, somebody brought a note to him. His wife sent word to him. And she said, have nothing to do with this righteous man. For I suffered many things in a dream because of him. Oh, that must have brought the fear of God in Pilate. Because yes, Pilate's sitting, he's got all this pressure on him. He really doesn't want Jesus to be crucified. He has the power to do it or not to do it. And here they send word from his wife. And his wife says, have nothing to do with him. Basically, let him go or get out of this case. Because I suffered many things in a dream because of this man. Why would she dream why would Pilate's wife dream about Jesus? Because Jesus was not any regular man. Jesus was the Son of God. Now I ask you, what did he dream? I wonder what he dreamt. What did she dream? I wonder what she dreamt. One day I preached and my mind just flowed as I preached. But maybe she dreamt that she died. Maybe she dreamt that she saw this judgment seat and she thought that that was Pilate. And she saw, maybe she did see Pilate for a, a while. Maybe she saw Jesus standing there before Pilate in her dream. And then she saw the things that happened, how Jesus get crucified and finally how Pilate comes off his throne and Jesus sits on his throne after his resurrection. And she sees this man a, shining with bright glory on his throne and she sees her herself and Pilate himself standing before this great God. And she goes a little closer and she looks at his hands and she looks at his feet and she sees the nail pierced hands and the nail pierced feet and she realized this man that is about to be crucified is the one that will be on the judgment seat and while Pilate is judging him now, Jesus 
will judge him one day. And that's going to happen. One day Pilate will stand before Jesus. One day Pilate's wife will stand before Jesus. One day you and I will stand before Jesus, the great judgment throne. I want to tell you, we have to be ready. We got to make ready. We can't live our life as if it won't happen. We have to live our lives every day knowing we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We will stand in that great white throne judgment and nothing in this world that you, you, your marriage, the, the person you marry is not as important. The career you do is not as important. What's the most important is have you accepted Jesus and are you ready for that great judgment day? I want to tell you, accept Jesus, receive Jesus. At the end of this message, I'm going to share with you a prayer in which you will be able to pray a prayer to receive Jesus. But I'm not done. I'm not done. I know we've been here a long time, but I am not done because I've got some awesome stuff I'm going to, about to share still with you. I'm going to give you those bullet points in the book of Matthew 27, 25. Jesus alludes to the destruction of Jerusalem at 70 AD. In Matthew 27 verse 28, though they were mocking Jesus, they were affirming his royalty. In Matthew 27 verse 38 and Luke 23 verse 43, Jesus saved the soul of one of his fellow prisoners, fellow crucif being crucified, saved his soul. In Matthew 27, 46, Jesus says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know what that means? Firstly, he was fulfilling Bible prophecy. Psalms 22 was a messianic psalm speaking about the Messiah. And Jesus was that Messiah. And Jesus quoted that. My God, my God, what is, why hast thou forsaken me? When he said that, everybody understood. He's saying that I am the Messiah. But in addition to that, Jesus was really forsaken by God. Can you imagine the one who is God to be this forsaken by God? How is that possible? Well, it's because Jesus was not only God, He was also flesh. He was also human. And as a human, Jesus never experienced what it's like to be separated from God. But that day, you know, all through His life, Him and the Father were like this. He walked with God. He talked with God. He was God Himself. He was in union with his heavenly father but then there came the day the bible says that the wages of sin is death and so jesus received that death and the word death it really means separation it's a separation between god and man and for the first time when jesus hung on that cross he was separated from god he felt what it's like to be separated from god that is a supernatural thing because he didn't he did this willingly he did not sin. He didn't love sin more than his relationship with God. His relationship with God was his, as a man, was his greatest, greatest treasure. But he took your and my sin. That's how much he loved us. He took your and my sin and put his sin upon himself so that you and I could be free. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? And then the Bible says, and this is the big stuff I want to share with you. Matthew 27 verse 51. I want to read that for you because it is so powerful. Matthew 27 and verse 51. Look what happened when Jesus died. First we look at verse 50. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. So I want you to know when Jesus died, his spirit did not die. On the inside, he was still God. He was the person of God, the Son of God. But his outward man died. So when his outward man died, the spirit of the Son of God was still alive. Now, we don't have time to go into that right now. But G the Bible says he went into the dominion, the domain of the spirit world. And uh, he made an open spectacle of the enemy. Now what I do want to show you is, behold the veil when he died, the veil in the temple was rent in two from the top to the bottom. 
A veil in the temple was rent in two from the top to the bottom. Do you know what that signified? That signified the veil of separation between God and man. Now on Sunday morning, I'm going to share a much shorter message than I'm shared with you today. But Sunday morning, I'm going to share more of this and I'm going to take it from here and then take it all the way to the resurrection. So please be here. But for our purpose right now, I want to talk about that. And I'm done. I'm actually done right now. What does that veil signify? You see, in the temple, there was a thick veil. There was the ho most holy place on this side and the holy place on this side and the outer courts. And nobody could go into the most holy place. There was a thick, thick veil that was so thick, I believe Josephus says, it was so thick that 40 oxen could not tear it apart. So that's how thick that veil was. But when Jesus died, that veil was torn asunder. What does that signify? It says we now have boldness to enter into the Holy of Holies and meet God, meet Jesus, meet our Heavenly Father. So I close with that today. Supernatural events surrounding the resurrection of Jesus, uh, the death of Jesus. And I want to ask you right now, if you have not yet received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, would you please pray this prayer with me right now? Won't you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Wash my sins away with your precious blood. Lord Jesus, I confess with my mouth, I believe with my heart that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. I hear you knock at my door, I open my heart. Come in, Lord Jesus, and be my Lord and my Savior. I confess with my mouth, I believe with my heart, Jesus is my Lord. My friend, if you prayed that prayer, I want you to know the Bible says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That means that you have just been saved. If you prayed that prayer, you've called upon the name of the Lord and the Bible says you're saved. Write the date down. Remember this date as the day that you accepted Christ and you are saved. Now, I want to encourage you to get baptized. Baptized in the name of Jesus. Baptized in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Baptized by immersion. What the word baptism really means is immersion. And go to a good Bible-based Pentecostal Holy Ghost filled church. Amen. And... Um, fellowship with other Christians and read the Bible, whether it's a paper Bible or your, or your digital Bible, read the Bible and grow in the things of God. I want to pray for your healing right now. If you need healing, I stretch forth my hands to you. Father, your word says by his stripes we are healed. So right now I speak healing in the name of Jesus over your people. I come against every single sickness in the mighty name of Jesus. I command every sickness to shrivel up and die before the power of God. Lord Jesus, as you said, it is I and power went forth from you and dropped into the floor. So I say right now, Jesus, your power power flows right now and heals every disease and every sickness among the people in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Just say, Lord, I receive that right now. I receive healing in the name of Jesus. I receive healing in Jesus' name. I believe that you're being healed right now. I feel the healing power of God just flowing into you. Thank you, Jesus. Those on the phone, the healing power of God is flowing right into you. In Jesus' name. Those on YouTube and Facebook, the healing power of God is flowing into you and healing you in the name of Jesus. Let's take communion. I have my cracker here and I have my grape juice. You can use anything. You might have some bread. You might have a cracker. You might have Grape juice, you might have water, it can be in any cup. Let's first partake of 
the body of Christ. Just take that bread or cracker, just break it, and you can eat the whole one or, or just part of it. But right now we partake of the communion. And now take the cup. Just raise it before the Lord. Say, Lord, thank you for the precious blood of Jesus. Praise God. Well, isn't it wonderful? Praise God to be in the presence of the Lord. Well, we're done now. Before you go, I want to give you an opportunity to give in the offering. And I do want to tell you, please be with us Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. You can call the number on your screen to, to connect by phone or you can connect with Facebook or with YouTube. But now I want to give you the opportunity to give into the ministry. You know, this is what we do. We're in the ministry. Uh, we can't be together right now. Uh, but we are together in a different way. So how you can do that is you can mail your offering in or you can go online and make an online donation or you can call us. And we can take your credit card over the phone. If you call us, it's 302-858-0887. We can take your credit card over the phone. If you want to go online, you go to joelhitchcock.com. I'll have a link in the description. Click on that. Or just go to joelhitchcock.com and you'll see Donate. Click on Donate. And that, that's a big picture right there. Click on the Donate picture and it will take you to a place where you can give online. If you want to mail your offering in, you can make your check out to Joel Hitchcock Ministries or River City Church. And that is P.O. Box 936, Georgetown, Delaware, 19947. Thank you so much for your support. We really appreciate it. And I bless you now in the name of Jesus. I declare that you are the head and not the tail. You're above only and not beneath. The Lord blesses your coming in and your going out. The Lord blesses you in the city. The Lord blesses you in the field. Everything you do shall prosper in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you and see you Sunday at 10 a.m.